Um, hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for showing up for the stream. Um, we're going to have a great show today. Great show for you today. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to Python Bytes, where we deliver Python news and headlines directly to your earbuds. This is episode 265, recorded January 5th, 2022. I'm Brian Aachen. I'm Michael Kennedy. And I'm Matt Kramer. Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks. <laughs> Happy to be here. Yeah, so, welcome, Matt. Who are you? Oh, so a uh, huge fan. I've listened to every episode. Um, I actually, I'm one of these folks that started their career outside of software. Um, I've heard a similar parallel story a bunch of times in the past. So I have my degree actually in uh, naval architecture, marine engineering, which is design of ships and offshore structures. Um, mm -hmm. in, grad, in grad school, I started, I was started with MATLAB, picked up Python, uh, thanks to a professor. And then over time, that's just grown and grown. Um, spent eight years in the oil and gas industry. Um, and using Python mostly for doing engineering analysis, a lot of digital type stuff, um, IoT type monitoring work. And uh, about three months ago, I joined Anaconda as a software engineer, and I'm working on our Nucleus cloud platform as a back-end software engineer. Very cool. Awesome. Yeah. Well, congrats on the new job as well. That's a big change from oil and gas. <laughs> to, uh, a couple of years. I, I mean, it is in Texas and all, but it's still yeah. uh, it's still on the tech side. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's related, but obviously a different focus. I wanted to make writing code my job rather than the thing I did to get my job done. So, um, fantastic! Yeah, not, I'm sure you're having a good time. Yeah. Well, uh, Michael, we had some questions for people last week. We did. Uh, I want to make our first topic a meta topic, and by right. that I mean a topic about Python bytes. So you're right. We discussed whether the format which is sort of i wouldn't say changed it's i would rather categorize it as drifted over time yeah. <laughs> it's it sort of drifted to adding this little thing or do that different thing and we just said hey everyone do you, do you still like this format it's not exactly what we started with but it's it's where we are so we asked some questions the first question i asked which i have an interesting follow-up at the end here by the way is is python bytes too long at 45 minutes that's roughly the the time that we're we're going these days, probably about forty five minutes. And so I would say, got to do the quick math here. I would say seventy sixty five percent. Let's say sixty five percent are like, no, it's good. With a third uh, of that being like, are you kidding me? It could go way longer. I'm not sure we want to go way longer, but right. there are definitely a, a couple of people that think, yeah, it's it's getting a little bit long. So I would say probably. 12% of people said it's too long. So I feel like it's actually kind of a, a, a decent length. And one of the things I, th I thought, it's like, as we've changed this format, we've added things on, right? We added the joke that we started always doing at the end. We added our extra, extra, extra stuff. But the original format was the, the six items. You covered three, I covered three. Now it's two, two, and we got Matt here to help out with that. Yeah. So what is the length of that? And it turns out that that's pretty much the same length still. So the last episode's 39 minutes, 32 minutes, 35 minutes, 33 minutes. That's how long our, our main segments up to okay. the end of the minute. So it's kind of like for people who feel it's too long, I wanted to sort of say like, feel free to just delete it. Like you hear the six items, like delete it at that point. If you don't want to hear the, us ramble about other things that are not pure Python, you don't hear us talk about the joke or tell jokes. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> just, just. <laughs> Stop. Just stop it's at the end for a reason so yeah. if you're kind of like all right well, i'm kind of done then then be done that's totally good yeah um we'll put the important stuff up first uh the other one was uh do you like us having a third co-host like matt or uh shell or whoever it is we've had on recently and most people love that format or you know or at least that's okay. I, it's okay so that's like I, I think that that's that's pretty good i do want to read out just a couple of comments as well there's stuff that you always get that are like, you just can't balance it. A couple of people are saying like, you just got to drop the joke. Like, don't do that. The other people are like, the joke is the best. Who doesn't want to stay for that? So, <laughs> you know, like, well, again, it's at the end. So um, you, you can do that. But I also just wanted to say thank you to everybody. They, they wrote a ton of nice comments to you and me at the end of that Google forum. So um, one is, I can't tell what counts as an extra or normal, but it's fine. I love it. Python Bytes is such an excellent show. Fun way to keep current. Um, Brian is awesome. Um, oh, good. I asked yeah. my daughter to submit that. 
So, she's, she's been good. I think your third guest, having a third guest is great. Like I said, drop the jokes. Keep the jokes for sure. Ideal. Um, I. So anyway, there, there's a bunch of uh, nice comments. I think yeah. the other thing uh, that I would like to just speak to real quick and get your thoughts on, and, and maybe you as well, Matt, because you've mm -hmm. been on the receiving end of this a lot, is us having the live audience, right? I think having a live audience is yeah. really interesting. I also want to just acknowledge, like, we knew that that would be a slight drift of format, right? So if you're listening in the car and there's a live audience comment, it's kind of like, well, but I'm not listening to it live. That's kind of different, but I think it's really valuable. One time we had four, maybe four Python core developers commenting on the stuff yeah. we were covering. Like that's a huge value to have people coming and sort of feeding that in. So for me personally, I feel like it's, yeah, it's a little bit of a, a blend of formats, but I think having the feedback from the audience, especially when people are involved in what we're talking about, I think that's worth it. Brian, what do you think? Well, Matt? we, we, we try not to uh, to let it interrupt the flow too much, but there's some great stuff. Like if somebody, uh, if we say something that's just wrong, uh, somebody will correct us, and that's that's nice. Um, the other thing is uh, sometimes somebody has a great question on a topic that like we should have we should have talked about, but we didn't. Yeah. We didn't. We, so. we didn't. Right. We don't know everything. We certainly don't. Um, so yeah. I, I do want to add one more thing. Um, the there was a comment like hey we as hosts should let the guest speak we should be better interviewers i'm like this is not an interview <laughs> format you know like talk python is a great interview format well, that's where the guest is featured testing code is a great form interview format where the guest is featured this is sort of just three people chatting it's not really an interview format so uh, and, and we always mind. tell the guests to interrupt us and they <laughs> yes. just they don't much so yeah. yeah yeah so matt what do you think of this live audience aspect like do you feel like that tracks or is it good well yeah first of all thank i'm i'm a, i'm glad that uh people generally like having a guest otherwise this would have been very awkward <laughs> um but no i, I do like it i think well, where'd matt go oh he must have disconnected <laughs> there was one occasionally there is a kind of a a little bit of a disruption but i think in general it's been great yeah i've definitely been listening when times when um you know a bunch of people are chiming in because there's always as you know that you're you mentioned a GUI library and then there's about 12 other options that you may not have covered <laughs> exactly. and instead of waiting 12 weeks you could just get them right out um so i think that's great and I, i'm i'm generally a, a audio listener i listen when i'm walking my dogs but but i love having the video because when i am very when i'm interested in something i can go hop to it right away and and see what you're showing, um, which I really like. So yeah, awesome. Thank you. Uh, two other things that came to mind. Someone said it would be great if there's a way where we could submit like ideas and stuff like that for guests uh, and whatnot. Oh, yeah. um, I right hear the top in our menu. It says submit. <laughs> <laughs> so please uh, t reach out to us on Twitter. Send us an email. Do submit it there. The other one was uh, if we could have time links, like if. If you go to the the to listen and at some certain time a thing is interesting that's mentioned, be cool if you could like link at at a time. If you look in your podcast player, it has chapters and each chapter has both a link and a time. So uh, like the thing that Brian's going to talk about next, interpreters, if you want to hear about that during that section in your podcast player, you can click the chapter title and it will literally navigate you to there. So it's already built in. Just make sure you can see it in your device. Yeah. All right. Uh, I think that's it uh, for that one. But yeah, thank you for everybody who had comments and, and took the time. Really appreciate it. Yeah. And just to comment, if you uh, if you want to be a guest, just email on that form <laughs> and you might be able to do it. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. Great to have you here. Um, actually, I didn't want to talk about interpreters. No, that's me. <laughs> oh, wait. <laughs> You're right. Well, you're talking about it now because I, I've changed. No, no yeah. let's talk about Adder. Sorry, I, I saw the wrong screen. No, that's, before. That's, <laughs> apparently, we're not professional here, but uh, no, it's okay. <laughs> um, I wanted to talk about Adders. We I, we haven't really talked about it much for a while because there are lots of reasons. But Adders is a great library, and it just came out with Adders uh, came out with the release twenty one point three point zero, which is why we're talking about it now. And there's some document. There's a little bit of change. There's some changes and some documentation changes, and I really uh, in an article I wanted to cover. 
So one of the things you'll see right off the bat, if you look at the di- the overview page of the Adder's site, is is it is it's highlighting the uh, the define uh, decorator. It's a different kind of way that if you've used Adder's from years ago, this is a little different. So the there's a there's there was a different way to, to a different API that was added in the last release. And this is, um, or, or one of the previous releases. And now that's the, the preferred way. So this is what we're calling modern adders. Um, but along with this, I wanted to talk about an article, uh, that Hinnick wrote, um, about, about adders. And it's a little bit of a history and I really love this discussion. So, um, and I'll try to quickly go through the history. Uh, early on, we didn't have data classes. Obviously, we had we could handcraft classes, but there were problems with it. And there was a library called Characteristic, which I didn't know about. This was this was uh, before I started looking into things. Um, that and then Glyph and Hinnick in in 2015 were discussing it, ways to change it, and that begat the old original adders. Um, interface and there were things like adder.s and adder attrib that were partly out of the fact that the old way of characteristic attribute was a lot of typing so they wanted something a little shorter um and then it kind of took off um adders was pretty pretty popular for a long time especially fueled by a 2016 article by glyph called the one python library everyone needs uh which was a great uh this is kind of how i learned about it um and then uh there was a you know different kind of api that we were used to for adders and it was good and everything was great and then in 2017 uh guido and hinnick and eric smith talked about um at in the pycon 2017 they talked about how to make something like that in the standard library uh and that came out of that came pep 557 and data classes and data classes showed up in uh in python 37 um and then so what then a dark period happened which was people were <laughs> like why do we need adders anymore if we have data classes well um that's one of the things i like about this this article and then there's a an attached article that is called why not uh, why not uh why not data classes instead of adders and um and this is uh uh, th- it's it's important to realize that data classes have always been a limited set of t- adders. Adders was a is a superset of functionality, and there's a lot of stuff missing in data classes, like uh, like uh, e- equal equality customization and validators. Validators and converters are very important if you're using a lot of these. Um, um, and then also people were like, well, data classes kind of a nicer interface, right? Well. Not anymore. Um, the uh, the pound defines pretty, or the at defines really nice. This is a really easy interface now to work with. So anyway, yeah, and it has typing, and it has typing. Um, and and I'm glad he wrote th- wrote this because I'm I kind of was one of those people of like, um, am I doing something wrong if I'm if I'm uh, using data classes? Uh, why should I look at adders? And one of the things there's a whole bunch of reasons. One of the things that I really like is adders. Uh, has uh, slots the the slots are on to by by default so you have um you kind of define your class once instead of uh keeping it growing whereas the default python way in data classes is to allow classes to grow at runtime have more more attributes but that's not really how a lot of people use classes so if you if you came from another language where you have to kind of define the class once and not at runtime um adders might be a closer fit for you so I like it. And it's whether you say at define or at data class, pretty similar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Adders is really cool. I, I personally haven't used it, but I've always wanted to try it. Um, we're using fast API and, and Pydantic. So I've really come to like that library, but adders is something that looks really full featured and nice. Um, definitely something I want to pick up. Yeah, it's cool. And Pydantic it also seems very inspired by data classes, which I'm learning now. I suspected, but now learning that is actually inspired by adders and they kind of sort of leapfrog each other in this, this same trend, yeah. which is interesting. Yep. So, yeah, cool. Good one, Brian. All right. 
Matt? All right. So I, I thought Brian was going to talk about this, but you can talk about it. If this you would be me. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this one's not strictly Python related, but I think it's very relevant to Python. Um, so I mentioned earlier, I, I came from a non CS background um, and I've always, I've just been going down the rabbit hole for about 10 years now, trying to understand everything and pick it up and, and really connect the dots between how do these very flexible objects that you're working with every day, how do those get actually implemented? Um, and so the first thing I did, have you heard of this guy, Anthony Shaw? Um, he, yeah, I think he's been mentioned <laughs> once or twice. He wrote a yeah. great book, uh, shout out to Python internals. Really yeah, like Anthony, Anthony's out in the audience. He even says yeah, happy, happy new year. Yeah. yeah. Happy New Year. <laughs> so this book is great if you want to learn how C Python's implemented. Um, but because I don't have a traditional CS background, I've always wanted, you know, I felt like I wanted to get a little bit more to the fundamentals. And I don't remember where I found out about this book, but crafting interpreters, um, I got the paperback here too. I highly recommend it. It's 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 a um implementation of a language from start to finish. Every line of code is in the book. Uh, it's a dynamic interpreted language. Um, much like Python, um, but I really like how the book is structured. So it is, uh, it was written over, I think, five years in the open. Um, I, I think the paperback may have just come out last year, but you walk through every step from tokenization, scanning, building a syntax tree, um, and all the way through the end. But what I really like about it is, is you actually, uh, you develop two separate interpreters for the same language. So the first one is written in Java. Um, it's a direct um, evaluation of the abstract syntax tree. Um, so that was really how I got a lot of these bits in my head about what is an abstract syntax tree? How do you start from there? How do you represent these types? But the second part is actually very, where I think it becomes really relevant for Python because you, the second part is written in C. It's a bytecode virtual machine um, with garbage collection. So it's not exactly the same as Python, but if you want to dig down into how would you actually you know, implement this with the types that you have available for you in C, um, but get something flexible, much like Python, I really recommend this. Um, so again, it's not directly, there's some good side notes in here where they, he compares, you know, different implementations between different languages like um, Python and JavaScript, et cetera, Ruby. But I really like this book. I devoured it during my time between jobs and um, yeah, I, I, I keep telling everyone about it. So I thought it would be good for the community to hear. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, I didn't study this stuff in college either. I mostly studied math and things like that. And so understanding how virtual machines work and, and all that is just how code executes. I think it's really important. You know, it's it's not the kind of thing that you actually need to know how to do in terms of you got to get anything done with it. But sometimes your intuition of like, if I ask the program to work this way and it doesn't work as you expected, you expect you know, maybe understanding that internals like oh it's because the it's mm. really doing this and oh everything's all scattered out on the heap and i thought numbers would be fast why are numbers so slow but okay i understand now <laughs> yeah I, I i really like the i mean it answered a lot of questions for me like how does a hash map work right that's a dictionary in python what is yeah. a stack why would you use it what is the when you do a disassemble and you see bytecode what does that actually mean right mm. um so yeah. I really, uh, really enjoyed it. And he's got a really great um, books open source. It's got a really great build system. If you're interested in writing a book, it's very cool how the yeah. adding lines of code and things like that are all embedded in there. And he's got tests um, written for every part where you add a new, you know, a new bit to the code. There's tests written and there's ways where he uses macros and things to block them out. It's pretty, pretty interesting. So, nice. Testing <laughs> books. Uh, that's pretty excellent. Yeah. Yeah. So Matt, now being at Anaconda, like that world, the tool, the Python world over in the data science stack, and especially around there has so much of like, here's a bunch of C and here's a bunch of Python and they kind of go together. Does this give you a deeper understanding of what's happening? Yeah, uh, for sure. I think um, C Python internals gave me a really good understanding a bit about a bit more about the C API and, and why that's important. Um, and as I'm sure you, well, as you know, and the listeners may know, like the binary compatibility is really important um, between the two and dealing with locking and the, you know, the uh, global interpreter lock and everything like that. Um, so it's definitely given me a better conceptual view of how these things are working. As you mentioned, I don't, you don't need to know it necessarily on a day-to-day -day basis, but I've just found it. It's given me a much better mental model. Having an intuition is valuable. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, quick audience feedback. Sam out in the live audience says, I started reading this book over Christmas Day and it's an absolute joy. So yeah, very cool. Uh, one more vote of confidence for you <laughs> there. Cool. Um, Brian, are we ready for my, my next one? Yes, definitely. A, a little uh, Yamale. Yeah, I'm hungry. <laughs> so this one is cool. Uh, it's called Yamale or Yamale. Um, I'm not 100% sure, but it was suggested by Andrew Simon. Thank you, Andrew, for sending this in. And the idea of this is we work with YAML files that's often used for configuration and whatnot. But if you want to verify your YAML, right, it's just text. Maybe you want to have some YAML that has a number for a value, or you want to have a string, or maybe you want to have true false, or you want to have some nested thing, right? Like you could say, I'm going to have a person in my YAML, and then that person has to have fields or values set on it, like a name and an age. With this library, you can actually create a schema that talks about what the shape and types of these are, much like data classes. And then you can use Yamali to say, given a YAML file, does it validate? Think kind of like Pydantic is for JSON. This is for YAML, except it doesn't actually parse the result out. It just tells you whether or not it's, it's correct. Isn't that cool? I think it looks neat. Um, yeah. Yeah, so it's it's uh, pretty easy to work with. Uh, obviously, it requires modern Python. It has a CLI version, right? So you can just say Yamali, give it a schema, give it a file, and it'll go through and, and check it. It has a strict and a non-strict mode. It also has an API. So and then to use it, just say Yamali.validate schema and data, either in code or on the CLI. And in terms of schemas, like I said, it looks like data classes. You just have a file like name colon stir, age colon int, and then you can even add additional limitations like the max integer value has to be 200 or less, which is pretty cool. Uh, then also, like I said, you can have um, more complex structures. So for example, they have what they call a person, but then the person here actually you can nest them. So you could have like part of your YAML could have a person in it. And then your person schema could validate that person. So very much like oh, nice. Pydantic, but for YAML files, like here you can see, you scroll down, there's a, an example of, I think it's called recursion is how they refer to it. <laughs> but you can have like nested versions of these things and so on. So if you're working with YAML and you want to validate it through unit tests or some data ingestion pipeline or, or whatever, I uh, just want to make sure you're loading the files correctly, then you might as well hit it with some Yamali, I'm mm -hmm. guessing. One of the things I like about stuff like this is that um, things like YAML files, sometimes people just sort of edit it in, in the Git repo uh, <laughs> instead of making sure it works first. And then it gets, and then having a, a CI stage that says, hey, making sure the, uh, the YAML's valid syntax is, is pretty nice so that you... Um, so that you know it before it blows up somewhere else with some weird error message. So, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, this is really cool. The validation of these types of input files, especially YAML files, is really tough. I've found just because it's indentation based and um, white space <laughs> is not a bad thing, obviously. But for YAML, it's tough. I, I can't tell you how many hours I've banged my head against the wall in a past life um, trying to get Ansible scripts to run and things like that. So this is really neat. Um, yeah, and anytime cool. I see something like this, I just wish that there was one way to describe those types somewhere, like <laughs> and preferably in Python, just because I like that more. But this is really cool. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if there's some kind of pedantic mapping to YAML instead of to JSON, uh, and you can just kind of run it through there. But yeah, I think this is more of a challenge than it is, say, for JSON, because JSON, there's a validity to the file, regardless of what the schema is, where YAML less so, right? Like, well, if you didn't indent that, well, it just, that means it's, it belongs somewhere else, I guess, you know, it's a little, yeah. a little more free form. So I guess that's why it's popular, but also nice to have this validation. So yeah. Thank you for Andrew. Thank you to Andrew for sending that in. Um, yeah. So next I wanted to talk about Pimpler, uh, which is a great name. <laughs> um, and I, 
I honestly can't remember where I saw this. I think it was a post on or something by Bob Belderbos, um, or something he wrote on Pie Bites. I'm not sure. Um, anyway, so I'll give him credit. Maybe it was somebody else. So if it was somebody else, I apologize. But anyway, what is Pimpler? Pimpler is a little tiny library which has a few tools in it, and it has uh, one of the things it says is um, uh. One of the things I saw, it does a few things, but what I it, it measures, monitors, and analyzes memory behavior in Python objects. Um, but the it's the memory size thing that that was interesting to me. So um, you've got uh, like for instance, uh, it, it has three three tools built into it: a size of, and Muppy, which is a great name, <laughs> uh, and class tracker. So a size of is a um, provides a basic size information for one or a set of objects, and Muppy is a monitoring. I didn't play with this. I didn't play with the class, class tracker either. Class tracker provides offline analysis of lifetimes of Python objects. Might be yeah, that's interesting. Maybe, maybe if you've got a memory leak, you could see like there's a hundred thousands yeah. of my hundreds of thousands of this type, and I thought I only had three of them. Yeah, and so one of the things that I really liked of uh, with a size of is it, I, it's it, it. I mean, we already have um, uh, sys get size of in Python, but that just kind of tells you the size of the object itself, not of the um, like later on. So a size right. of will tell you not just what the size of the object is, but all of the recursively. It goes recursively and and uh, looks at the size of all the stuff that it contents of it. So right, and people haven't looked at this. You know, they should check out Anthony's book, right? But if you've got a list and say the list has a hundred items in it, and you say what is the size of the list, the list will be roughly nine hundred bytes because it's a hundred eight byte pointers plus a little <laughs> bit of overhead. Those pointers could point at megabytes of memory. You yeah. could have a hundred megabytes of stuff loaded in your list. And if it's really only hundred, like, no, that's 900 bytes, not 800 megabytes or whatever. Right. So you really need to, if you actually care about real whole memory size, you got to use something like a size of it's cool that this is built in. I, I had to write this myself and uh, it was not as fun. Yeah, this is awesome. I, I also, I, I hit this um, sometime in grad school. I remember <laughs> when I was kind of had a deadline or something. And uh, just I hit the same thing about the number of bytes in a list being so small and just writing something that was hacky to try to do the same thing. But to have it so nice and available is great. And the name yeah. is awesome. I love <laughs> silly names. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, one of the examples, and I, I was confused that the example we're showing on the screen is uh, just a, there's, you've got a, a list of um, a few items, some of it's a text. So uh, some of them are integers and some are lists of integers or tuples of integers and being able to go down and, and do the size of everything. But then there's also a, you can get more detailed. You can uh, give it um, a sized, uh, a size uh, with, with a detail numbers. I'd have to look at the API to figure out what all this means, but the example shows each element, uh, not just the total, but each element, what the size of the different components are, which is kind of cool, but it lists like a flat size. And I'm like, what's the flat thing? So I had to look that up and uh, flat, the uh, flat size returns the flat size of a Python object in bytes determined as the basic size. So like in these examples, it's uh, like the tuple is just a flat, uh, the tuple itself is 32 bytes, but the, the tuple and its contents is 64. Sort of I thing. see. So flat is like sys.get size of and size is a size of that bit. <laughs> I <laughs> the think, recursive. I yeah, think, I think, think so. that's what it is. Uh, but yeah, not sure. But that's what yeah, I'm So for people who are listening, they don't see this. You should check out the docs page, right? Like a usage yeah. example, because if you have a, a list containing a bunch of stuff, you can just say basically print this out and it shows line by line this part of the the list was this much and then it pointed at these things each of those things is this big and it has constituents and and so on uh, yeah. I, my theory is that the detail equals one is recurse one level down but don't keep traversing to like show the size of numbers and stuff yeah probably yeah cool yeah i love it this is great awesome. yeah Oop. <laughs> all right Matt, I think it's all. <laughs> okay, so um, I, I'm going to talk about HVplot and uh, HVplot.interactive um, specifically. 
Um, so this is something I actually wasn't very aware of until I joined Anaconda. But one of my colleagues, uh, Philip Rodiger, who I know is on Talk Python uh, at one point, um, is our is the developer working on this. And there's basically there's you know when you're working in the PyData ecosystem, there's pandas and XArray and Dask. There's all these different data frame type interfaces, and there's a lot of plotting interfaces. And there's a project called Hollow Views or HVPlot, which is a consistent plotting API for that you can use. And, and the really cool part about this is you can swap the back end. So for example, um, Panda's default plot will use dot plot and it'll make a matplotlib. But if you want to use something more interactive like Bokeh or Hollow Views, um, you can just change the back end and you can use the same commands to do that. Um, so that's, oh, that's really cool. And you set it on the, on the data frame. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. So what you, what you do is you import hvplot.pandas and then on the data frame, if you change the back end, you just do data frame dot plot. Um, and there's a bunch of kind of, you know, rational defaults built in for how it would show the different columns in your data frame, um, versus the index. And then I, I like that. Cause you could swap out the plots by writing one line, even if you've got hundreds of lines of plotting and stuff, right. And it just picks it up. Exactly. Yeah. And, and the common workflow for a data scientist is you got, a, you're reading in a lot of input data, right? Then you want to transform that data. So you're doing um, generally a lot of method chaining uh, is a common pattern where you want to do things like filter and select a time and maybe pick a drop a column and do all kinds of things. Right. At the end, you either want to show that data or write it somewhere or plot it, which is very common. Um, now this interactive part, um, Philip, demoed this, or he gave a talk at PyData Global about two months ago, I think. Um, it kind of extends on that. And this blew my mind when I saw it. So um, if you had a data frame like thing and you put dot interactive after it, then you can put your method chaining after that. So I'll, this is an example where you say, I want to select um, a discrete time and then I want to plot it. And this is this particular example is not doesn't have a kernel running in the back end, so it's not going to sweep. Switch, but if you were running this um, in an actual live uh, notebook, it would be changing the time on this chart. And again, this is built to work with the um, a lot of the big data type APIs that match the pandas API. Nice. Um, so for people listening, if you say dot interactive and then you give the parameter that's meant to be interactive, that just puts one of those I Python widget yeah. things into your notebook right there, right? That's cool. Yeah. So uh, a, a related a uh, library is called Panel, which is um, it is for building dashboards directly from your notebooks. Um, so you can, if you had a, a Jupyter notebook, you could say Panel serve and pass in the notebook file, um, and it'll make a dashboard. That's the thing I want to show in a, in, a, in a second here. But the w the way the interactive works is really neat. So wherever you would put a number, you can put one of these widgets, and so you can have time selectors. You can have things like um, sliders and you can have input boxes and things like that and all you do is you would change the place where you put your input number at put one of those widgets in and then it sort of it, it i actually don't know how it works exactly under the hood but from what i understand you put this interactive in and then it's capturing all the different methods that you're adding on to it and anytime one of those widget changes it will change everything from that point on um and so the the demo here was from another panel contributor, Mark Scoff Matson, um, and I'm just going to play this and try to explain it. So we have a data pipeline on the right where we've chained methods together, um, and what he's done here is he's just placed a widget in as a parameter to these different methods on your data frame, and then this is actually a panel dashboard that's been served up in the browser, and you can see this is all generated from the, the little bit of code on the right. So if you want to do interactive data analysis or exploratory data analysis, you can really do this um, very easily with this interactive function. And when I saw this, I kind of <laughs> hit myself in the head because the, normally my pattern here was I had a cell at the top with a whole bunch of constants defined. And you know I would manually go through and, OK, change the time, start time from this time to this time or change this parameter yeah. to this and run it again and, and over and over. And and you got to remember to run all the cells that are affected exactly. by it. So the, yeah. fact that, the fact that you can kind of do this um, interactively while you're working, um, I could see how this would just, you know, you don't break your flow while you're trying to, to work. And the method chaining itself is 
I really like too, because you can comment out each stage of that um, as you're going and debugging what you're working on. So um, yeah, this is really neat. And I definitely, I, I put a link in the show notes to the actual talk, um, as well as this gist that Mark Scott Matson put on GitHub. And um, yeah, it's it blew my mind. It would have made my life a lot easier had I known about this earlier. So um, <laughs> Yeah, and one of the important things I, I think about plotting and uh, interactive stuff is it's not even if your end result isn't a panel or a, an interactive thing. Um, uh, sometimes getting to see the see the plots, seeing seeing the data in a visual form helps you understand what you need to do with it. Uh, yeah, no, exactly. I mean, I did a lot of work in the past with time series data and time series data, especially if this was sensor data. You had a lot of dropouts. Um, you might have spikes and and you're always looking at it and trying to make some judgment about your filter parameters and 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 being able to have that feedback loop between um, changing some of those and seeing what the result is um, is a huge game changer. So yeah, yeah. and you you can hand it off to someone else who's not writing the code and say, here, you play with it and you you tell it, you know, give it to a scientist or somebody. Oh, that's, a, that's exactly right. That's what panel's all about is, what the, the biggest challenge that I always had and many data scientists have is you do all your analysis in a notebook, but then you got to show your manager or you got to show your teammates. And going from that, going through that trajectory is can be very challenging. Um, these new tools are amazing to do that. But that's how I turned myself into a software engineer because that's what I wanted to do. But I went out, went down the rabbit hole and learned Flask and Dash and how to deploy web apps and all this stuff and yeah <laughs> well i'm glad you did yeah maybe i wouldn't be here if i hadn't done that but but yeah this is really <laughs> cool and i definitely recommend people look at this um there was also another talk this sorry this is an extra but um there was another talk at PyData global um hosted by jim james bednar who's our head of consulting but he leads PyViz, which is a community for visualization tools and it was a comparison of four different um, dashboarding apps. So it was Panel, Dash, um, Voila, and Streamlit. And they, they just had you know main contributors from the four libraries talking about the benefits and pros and cons of all of them. So if anyone Very wants cool. to go look at those, I definitely recommend that too. It's really that, that sounds amazing. All those libraries are great. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Thanks. No problem. Oh, speaking of those extra parts of the podcast that make the podcast longer, uh, we should do some extras. <laughs> <laughs> we should. We should do some extras. Got any? Uh, I don't have anything extra. Pat, how about you? Yeah, um, two things. So first, um, if you can show my screen. Um, last year, Anaconda hired the Piston developers. Piston is a faster implementation fork of CPython. Um, I think it was at Instagram first. I can't recall. But anyway, before right before the holidays, they released um, pre-compiled packages for many of a couple hundred of the most popular Python packages. So if you're interested in trying Piston, um, I put a link to their blog post in here. Um, they're using Conda right now. They were able to leverage a lot of the Conda Forge recipes for building these. Um, this is that binary compatibility challenge that we talked about earlier. So yeah. um, I, I know the team's looking for feedback on, on that. And if you want to try that, feel free to go there. And it mentions in the blog that they're working on PIP, but that's a little harder to just because of how, um, you know, the build stages for all the packages aren't centralized with PIP. So it's a little more challenging for them to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and then just the, the last thing is, um, you know, I, I don't want to be too much of a, a salesman here, but um, we are hiring. It's an amazing place to work. And I definitely rec recommend anyone to go check it out if they're interested. Um, so fantastic. Yeah. You put a link in the show notes if people want to. Yeah. It's anaconda.com slash careers. Um, and we're doing a lot of cool stuff and growing. So uh, if anyone's looking for work in, uh, in data science or just software and building out some of the things we're doing to try to help the open source community um, and bridge that gap. Oops, I spelled it wrong. Bridge that gap between uh, enterprise and, and open source and data science in particular. Um, definitely check that out. Yeah, it definitely seems like a fun place to work. So cool. People looking for a change or for a fun Python job. Yeah, and people do reach out. Too. Yeah, cool. People do reach out to Brian and me and say, hey, I really want to get a Python job. I'm doing other stuff, but how do I get a Python job? Help us out. So we don't know, but 
Uh, we hopefully. can recommend places like Anaconda for sure. Yeah, it looks like there's about 40 jobs right now. And uh, so check it out. Fantastic. Oh, wow. That's awesome. All right. Well, Brian, would it, would it surprise you if I had some extra things? It would surprise me if you didn't. <laughs> all right. First of all, I want to say congratulations to Will McGugan. We have gone the entire show without mentioning rich or textual. Can you imagine? Almost. <laughs> but no, no. Only because I knew you were going to talk about this. Otherwise, I would have thrown it in. Yeah. So Will, last year, a while ago, I don't know the exact number of months back, but he was planning to take a year off of work and just focus on rich and textual. It was getting so much traction. He's like, I'm just going to you know, live off my savings and a small amount of money from the GitHub sponsorships and really see what I can do trying that. Well, it turns out he has plans to build some really cool stuff and has actually all based around rich and textual in particular. And he has raised a uh, first round of funding and started a company called textualize.io. How cool is that? Well, we don't know because we don't know what it's going to do. <laughs> All you do is if you go there, it's like a, a command prompt. You just enter your email address. Let's get enter. Nice. If something happens, let's find out what happens. Yes, I'm confirmed. Uh, basically, you just get notified about when Textualize comes out of stealth mode. But congrats to Will. That's fantastic. Another one, we've spoken about tenacity. Remember that, Brian? Yeah. So tenacity is cool. You can say, here's a, a function that may run into trouble. If you just put at you know, tenacity.retry on it and it crashes, it'll just try it again until it succeeds. That's probably a bad idea in production. So you might want to put something like stop after this or do a little delay between them or do both. I was having a race condition. We we're trying to track when people are attempting to hack, <laughs> talk Python, the training site, the Python byte site and all that. And it turns out when they're trying to attack your site, they're not even nice about it. They hit you with a botnet of all sorts of stuff and like lots of stuff happens at once and there was this race condition that was causing trouble so i i put retry a tenacity that retry boom solved it perfectly so i just wanted to say i finally got a chance to use this to solve some problems which was pretty cool <laughs> that's really cool i the other one that's similar to this which i've used and i think i don't know if you've used brian but it's called pytest flaky yeah. and oh, um wow. it's awesome nice. because i was working with um this time series data historian, I had a bunch of integration tests in my last job, but you know, network stuff, it would drop out occasionally. And so um, you can do th very similar type things and wrap your test um, in an at flaky decorator and do <laughs> similar type stuff and, and it, yeah. you know, give it three, three tries or something before you make it fail. So yeah, exactly. That's cool. That's what my, I think mine does three tries and it's like randomly a couple of second delay or something. Mm -hmm. Uh, Remember that part, Brian, where we talked about it's really cool if people are in the audience while we talk about stuff and then get a little feedback. So Will McGugan yep. says, hey, thanks, guys. Can't wait to tell you about it. Yeah, congrats, Will. That's awesome. Glad to see you out there. All right. Uh, a couple of other things. Did you know that GitHub has a whole new project experience? That's pretty awesome. Have you seen this? I haven't. I haven't seen so that. you know how it's like this Kanban board, Kanban board, um, where you have like columns, you can move your issues between them. So just last week, they came out with this thing called a beta projects where it still can be that, or it can be like an Excel sort of view where you have little drop down combo boxes. Like I want to move this one to this column by going through that mode or as a board, or you can categorize based on some specification, like show me all the stuff that's in progress and then give me that as an Excel sheet and all these different views you have for automation. And then like there's, APIs and all sorts of neat stuff in there. So if, if you've been using GitHub projects to do stuff, you know, you can check this out. It looks like you could move a lot of a lot more work towards that on the project management side of software than used to. This is really neat. Yeah. In my previous job, I was using Azure DevOps. Um, I was always wondering when some of those features might move to GitHub. I don't know if that's what happened here, but um, being able to have this type of project management in there for for you know this type of things, it's really Really great. Yeah, super cool. Yeah, one of the things I love about stuff like this is because uh, even, I mean, yes, a lot of companies do their project management on or projects on in GitHub or places like that. But also um, open source projects often have, they're often have the same needs of project management uh, as, as it, private commercial projects. 
So, yeah. Yeah. I personally, I, I only have a few open source small projects that are kind of personal and no one would probably want to use them, but even just keeping notes about to do's and future stuff and, um, <laughs> <laughs> it would be really nice. Yeah, just for future you, if nothing else. Right. right. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so this is cool. Now, the last, yeah, this last thing I want to talk about is Markdown. So, um, Roger Terrell turned me on to this. Um, there's this new Markdown editor. Uh, it's cross platform. Yes, cross platform called Typora. And we all spend so much time in Markdown that just wow this thing is incredible it's not super expensive and it looks like a standard markdown editor so you write markdown and it gives you a, a whizzy wig you know what you see is what you get style of programming which is not totally unexpected right but what is super cool is the way in which you interact with it and actually i am going to show you real quick so you can you two can see it and then you can tell people like what do you think about this uh here, I think that's it. Put that back. Waiting there. Okay. okay. Yeah. So here, here's here's mark here's a markdown file for um, my course, just the practices and whatever. You can say, you know what, I would like to view that in code style, All right? Well, that's kind of cool. We want to edit this. You click here, and it becomes ooh, it comes markdown. Becomes markdown. That's but this is a boring file. So let's see about. It has a whole file system that navigates like through your other Markdown stuff, hierarchically. So like here, chapter eight is a good one. So we go over to chapter eight on this. And now you can see some more stuff. Like you can go to set these headings and whatnot. But if you go to images, like you can set a caption and then you could even change the image like right here if it were a PNG. It's not, but so I'll put it back as JPEG and then it comes back. You can come down and write a code fence um, if you use the right symbol. And you can say def a, right, whatever. And then you pick a language. Isn't that, isn't that dope? Oh, this is so good. That's so awesome. if, if you end up writing a lot of Markdown, and if you need to get back, you just um, go back and switch back to raw Markdown and then go back to this fancy style. I, I think this is really a cool way to work on Markdown. I'm actually working on a book with Roger. And... Uh, it's got tons of markdown and it's been a real joy to actually use this thing on it. So yeah. Does it have Duh. VI mode? Probably not. <laughs> I don't know about that, but it has themes. Oh, like it has it has like you can do like a like a night mode or I could do like a newspaper mode or you know, take your pick. It's 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 pretty cool. The, the, weir uh, the weirdo grad student in me is upset that this isn't LaTeX. But it um, has it has built in LaTeX. Oh it has like you can do um, <laughs> Yeah, you can do like inline LaTeX and you can there's a bunch of settings you can set for the LaTeX. It's got a whole um a whole math section in there. Oh, I believe. that's sweet. Okay. Yeah, let's see. So, so am I the only person that went all the way through college pronouncing it latex? I did too, but I just learned that it, the cool way is saying latex. <laughs> okay, so. it's, it's LaTeX, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. French. No, I don't know. But no, yeah, it has it has support for like chemistry settings like inline LaTeX and math and all sides of good stuff. So yeah, it's, it's, I'm telling that's, you, this thing's pretty slick. Really so, cool. all right, well, I got to do my screen share back because so you all can see the joke because the joke is very good and we're going to cover it, Where's but it's joke? at the end. It's at the end. So if people don't want to okay. listen to the joke, they don't have to. Well, I, yeah. Brian, I blew it. You did? I blew it. I blew it. Uh, before I move off the markdown thing, though, Anthony Shaw says editorial for iPhone and iPad is really nice too. Um, cool. So, but let, let's do let's do the joke. So I I blew it because I was saving this all year. I saw this like last March, and I'm like, this is going to be so good for Christmas. Yeah. And then we kind of like had already recorded the episode. Oh, we're not going to do it. We'll just take a break over. So yeah. we didn't have a chance to do it. So. Let's do it now. People are going to have to go back just a, a little tiny bit for this one. Are, are you ready? Yes. Matt, you ready? Uh, yeah. So this goes, this is sort of a, a data database developer type thing here. And uh, <laughs> it's on a, I don't know why it's on a printout. But anyway, it's called SQL clause as in SQL clause. So it's, he's making a database, he's sorting it twice, select star from contract uh, contacts where behavior equals nice. SQL clause is coming to town. 
Nice. It would have been, so, <laughs> been, been so good for Christmas, but I, yeah. we can't keep it another year. I got to get it out. Of you got to sing it. Sequel Claus is coming. Coming yeah. to town. Yep, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I want to share a joke that I don't have a picture for. All right. Um, do it. But, but my daughter made this up last week. I think she made it up, but it's just been cracking me up for, and I've been telling it to everybody. So it's a short one. Imagine you walk into a room. And there's a line of people all lined up on one side. That's it. <laughs> That's the punchline. I love it. So. <laughs> nice. We've yeah, we got had my uh, we had my my cookie candle oh, last nice, time. Nice. My uh, my candle these cookies. We've got a, a a dad joke of the day channel in our Slack at work, and it's it makes me oof every time. <laughs> We've got, uh, nice uh, nice okay all right uh nice to see everybody thanks matt for joining yeah. the show thank you uh, for having me good to see you michael again as always yeah good to see you thank you thank you thanks matt no problem thanks